Every believer is a priest, and every believer or priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word, using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, precious Lord, for your provision to feed our souls at this morning hour as we gather together. As each believer who is positive to our doctrine has prepared his own heart and soul, we thank you that you will definitely provide that for each one which is necessary to cause their spiritual advance, that the pivot which we are, of which we are a part may maintain its faithfulness while there are many who are departing from doctrine to the place where it may be that even as the pivot we will not be sufficient to spare our nation but the doctrine in our souls will actually preserve us through the discipline which uh, is brought upon us I grant that God the Holy Spirit then, in teaching believers, will cause spiritual advance, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting to note that uh, with the current crisis, there are more people thinking and talking about the things of the Lord, but the problem and the great tragedy of it all is that they really don't want answers from the Word of God. They want emotional reassurances. They want, uh, they want panaceas. They want instant uh, gratification, instant solution. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons for the increased uh, charismatic activity is because according to their teaching, uh, you get the, uh, the quote-unquote baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues and you have instant spirituality without any work without any uh, giving yourself to study, uh, without any uh, effort, really, on your part. It's just something that comes, and you've got it. Now you're spiritual. Oh, that's, why, that's wonderful. But it isn't. <laughs> it isn't at all. It's pseudo-spirituality. But um, even, uh, even the believer who uh, shows some interest in doctrine uh, only God knows the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God is the one who knows what the heart is. Those who really are con interested in the Word of God, in Bible doctrine, in spiritual advance. The motivation that people will have for starting into such a study or of asserting that they are interested in su such kind of things is, well, they're multitudinous. There are all kinds of motivation, but the fact is that very few people are really interested in the Word of God. They are really interested in Bible doctrine. It's just like the average church, when they're looking for a pastor, they say, we want someone who is a real Bible teacher. But they really don't. They want someone to work with the young people, someone who will call on the old people, someone who will make a good impression at the Lions Club, someone who will uh, uh, be a spellbinder in the pulpit, someone who is a good programmer, and all those other things. And the preaching of the Word... They will tolerate poor preaching of the Word, poor teaching of the Word, for all these other things, and many, many of them for years and years. You see, it's a, it's a, a posse right down the line. But then, and those are the same people who are uh, asserting that they are spiritual, and they love the, the Word. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard in my 40, over 40 years in the ministry, ever heard anybody who is a believer say, I don't care for Bible study. But I, have, I haven't seen that much evidence of it in reality. And we're talking about uh, believers in the last time, uh, which is the church age, who uh, uh, are encouraged by the Apostle John in chapter 2, verse 19, uh, well, be, beginning in verse 18, to uh, use the divine dynasphere uh, because uh, of, the, of two things. First of all, in the doctrine of eschatology, uh, the Antichrist is coming now. Uh, we talked about it on Thursday evening uh, uh, because of the fact that uh, people are looking at the Middle East and they are saying 
uh, that uh, this, uh, uh, well, some are saying Armageddon, this is the first part of Armageddon, or uh, uh, that uh, uh, Saddam Hussein is the Antichrist and all kinds of things like that. And uh, they are uh, ignorant of, of prophecy. And they're not helped by well-known Bible teachers, particularly those who are uh, on television, who will go around and say that these are all signs of the times. Uh, you will be protected from this if you will remember this, that the church age is an intercalation. Uh, I use this word. Uh, uh, an intercalation is something... If you have two paragraphs in a, in a, in a piece of uh, literature, and you then uh, will uh, insert something between the two paragraphs, uh, it is called an intercalation. And uh, here we have uh, the, the church age as an intercalation between uh, the uh, dispensation of the Mosaic law and the dispensation of the millennial kingdom uh, and the, the, the dispensation of the Mosaic Law is divided, actually, uh, between, uh, according to uh, Daniel, 70 weeks. Uh, the 69 weeks are finished, and the 70th week is still to come, so uh, it will be taking place. But the, the church age is an intercalation in that there is no Old Testament prophecy at all regarding the church age. You must always remember that because people are always finding things in the Old Testament about uh, the, uh, the church age. And there is nothing there. There is absolutely nothing which is found in the Old Testament which prophesies the church age. The, the, the fact of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, first and second advents, are both prophesied. The salvation is very clearly available by grace in the Old Testament. But there is nothing in the Old Testament which prophesies the church age. Uh, the church age is called a musterion, or mystery in tra uh, tra transliteration, which is simply a sacred secret which was kept from all of the Old Testament prophets and was revealed only to the New Testament writers, particularly the Apostle Paul, though Peter also and John refer to it. And the point is, therefore, that any Old Testament prophecy that is going to be talking about anything in the future always has reference to Israel and never a reference to the church, which tells you that this fact, that before any prophecies which have been related to Israel or are related to Israel will take place, this unique organism called the church is going to have to be taken out of the way. In addition to that, we read about it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the fact that uh, they were being, the people in Thessalonica were being disturbed because there were people who were saying at that time that the coming of the Lord was, had already taken place, that the day of the Lord already started. And, he, and Paul writes and said, look, I don't care who tells you, you it's not true, and, and this is how you can know it. And then goes on to point out about the Antichrist and the fact that he will not be revealed until the church is taken up out of uh, the scene, off the scene completely. After he is taken, the church is taken out, then the Antichrist will be revealed. We're not, remember that the tribulation period, which is seven years in length, does not begin with the rapture of the church. The, the, the seven-year period of the, of the tribulation begins with the revealing of the Antichrist. That's what, it, the, you see, you, the 70th week of Daniel goes back to Daniel uh, chapter 9. And uh, in, if, if the church were found in Daniel chapter 9, then the church would not have been a musterion. But Daniel didn't know nothing about the church. And Daniel sees the 69th and 70th weeks of Daniel as running uh, uh, consecutively. He doesn't see that between the 69th and 70th weeks of Daniel or sevens of Daniel, comes the church age, the whole church age, which uh, to this point has lasted uh, 1,991 years, you know, almost. But uh, the point is that uh, the Antichrist's revelation will be the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, uh, or the, the, the final seven-year period. And who knows how long after the rapture of the church this uh, revelation of the Antichrist will take place. Nobody knows. That is not something that anybody really understands, which causes, remember, 
If, if it were pro if the if the rapture of the church were the beginning, then the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, the the time would be easy to figure out. All you'd have to do is to sit down with a calculator and figure out what seven years in a uh, after the date of seven years after the rapture would all these believers disappeared, and you know when the second advent is coming. But even of the second advent, nobody knows the time or the the, the day. That's still kept a secret. See, the, all, the Lord talks about of that day and hour knows no man. Nobody knows that day or hour. That's, a, that's kept a secret as well. And if you could figure it out by, by the day of the rapture of the church, you wouldn't, you wouldn't understand it. So apparently this, the revelation of the man of sin, the, the Antichrist, is going to take some uh, period of time. And what is actually his revelation when he first comes on the scene, when he proclaims the peace? All of these things are so nebulous that you're, nobody's going to be able to figure out that when the second advent of Jesus Christ is actually going to take place. So uh, uh, don't uh, become wrapped up with uh, uh, all these uh, idiots out there who are setting at times and talking about this being uh, a prophecy. And you must remember that you are acquainted with what's happening in the world today. But uh, down through history, there have been again and again and again people and occasions which have arisen which have, and circumstances of history which have given the concept very clearly that this is the time of the rapture. Why do they know that? Because there are certain things that are taking place in the world that make them think uh, that these are the fulfilling of signs. There is absolutely no prophecy that is contained about the church age. The church age is not prophesied. The beginning, the end, none of the church age is prophesied in Scripture. The only thing that we know is that the next event, as far as the church is concerned, the only thing that's prophesied regarding the church, and that is not a time, is the rapture of the church. When... Uh, uh, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Uh, and then we which are alive and remain shall uh, uh, join with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so that is the next event as far as we're concerned. And it is a signless and timeless event. It is uh, said to be imminent. That is, it could have taken place any time from the time that the Lord left to, the time, to this time or the future. It may be today, it may be tomorrow, it may not be for uh, a year or ten years, it may not be for a thousand years. We do not know what is in the plan of God. And so uh, what people are saying is this, well, if we could see signs of what's going to take place in the 70th week of Daniel, now in existence, then we know that the rapture must be close. Well, that is, again, ridiculous. That is an inference which is uh, an illegitimate inference because some of the things which are taking place today may or may not be signs of the coming, uh, the second advent or of, of the 70th week of Daniel. For example, they say wars and rumors of war. There has never been a time during the whole church age that there's not been wars or rumors of wars. Earthquakes in diverse places. Then they'll tell you about the earthquake here, there, and the other place. Well, you happen to realize that in our generation, we know more about what's happened around the world than they did a few years ago when there was not much of a, a news a, a, a dissemination ability. And so we didn't know about it, but there have been just as many earthquakes and uh, uh, all kinds of things. And then uh, they say signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. That means uh, people going into outer space with, with, with spaceships or, or rockets. <laughs> you see, you got all kinds of subjective people out there. And do not be taken in by these people, uh, and no matter how their reputation is. And uh, uh, remember, uh, if I should have some kind of a revelation and come to you tomorrow and tell you that I believe the Lord is coming on Thursday night, don't believe me. Uh, if Paul says, if, if, if even if I come back and, and, uh, or, or if an angel comes in, he's flapping his wings as he comes in and tells you this, don't believe it. It's not true. Understood. Rest on what the Word of God says and put everything by the test to the test of the Word of God. Um, as I've told you before, there have been, in my own experience, uh, all kinds of, t of date setters and time setters and, uh, chart people, 
uh, who are, they've got charts, and I used to have one that 20 feet long that I'd spread across the front of a church. In fact, I, I don't use it uh, anymore. I don't have the chart, but I have the copy of the chart that I use and uh, that I use, and, and I put it up here many times. You've seen it. Uh, but never, as the times, uh, I, don't, I don't, don't set times because I've always recognized the imminency of the coming of our Lord. But uh, Mussolini was supposed to be the Antichrist. The Pope has been the Antichrist down through the years. Oh, how many times the Pope has been the Antichrist. And uh, Kissinger was the Antichrist. They were sure a few years ago the but they, they had it figured out scientifically because if you say A and make it worth one point and B make it worth two points and C make it worth three, they took Kissinger, added it together, and it came out to 666, which is the mark of the beast, kind of the number, the number of the Antichrist. And so they knew that Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist because it added up to 666. I mean, that's as biblical as anything that they're coming up with, isn't it? It's, uh, how silly. Well, the... There are all kinds of idiots who, uh, we call them dilettantes, you know, who go around like a, the, the uh, hummingbirds sucking sap out of all the flowers, but they're the saps that are doing the sucking anyway. It's, it's really a, a, a tragedy to see that believers are captivated by just about anything that's new or different. Okay, that's why the cults... Uh, uh, thrive. Remember what Second Thessalonians also says. It goes on to say that having rejected the knowledge of the truth, they believe the lie. Once you have rejected the absolute truth of doctrine, you are, are susceptible to believe just about anything that comes down the pike. Anything. Well, as verse 18 says, positive believers, it is the last favorable time, that is, it is the church age, to use the divine dinosphere. Once the rapture takes place, there will be no more divine dinosphere. And just as you have heard that Antichrist will come, that's eschatological, the second one, in fact, at this present time, many Antichrists, with a small a, many Antichrists, he points out, exist. And for which reason we have come to know that it is the last favorable time to use the divine dinosphere. Then he describes in verse 19 these antichrists. And he says, uh, these antichrists separated from us. The us being believers positive toward Bible doctrine in John's Bible classes, which were being uh, uh, taught by some local pastor in response to his uh, letters. Nevertheless, they were not really part of us. And so, so we began to look at uh, the, this principle of the separation of believers. And before we proceed, we need to understand there are two kinds of separation. One is called reaction separation. And the other is called response separation. Reaction separation is apostasy. This is when some believer reacts. He may react against uh, uh, the teaching. Generally, this is what, uh, event, what, what grinds people, but they generally blame it onto something else. They may react against the pastor teacher, his delivery, his personality, his methodology, his policy, whatever it may be. They may react against the people. Uh, uh, you may be surprised that there are people who have left us because they say you're not friendly enough. Would you believe that? Uh, they, they actually say that. I can't understand that. But they're just as silly as the people who say they don't like me. <laughs> How could that possibly be? <laughs> Someone would not like me. Well, as I said, when you first meet me, you don't like me. After you get to know me, you hate me. But uh, these people are the same as you. They don't like you. Some people don't like you. Some people are uh, just think that you're not friendly enough uh, or that uh, you're, uh, a, you're snob. Who, well, I mean, true or false, it has no bearing on the, uh, the case at all, does it? Who cares? That's not the issue. Why do you go to church? Because people are friendly? Put up a big sign. The end of your search for a friendly church. People flock in. Why? They want a friendly church. You want friends? Join the Lonely Hearts Club. You know. 
I, I know a guy in our congregation sits over here. He sent his picture to the Lonely Hearts Club. They sent it back, said we're not that lonely. But uh, anyway, uh, I like to pick on him. He's, you know, nice. <laughs> but the people in apostasy react against something, and they separate themselves. Now, response separation is doctrinal separation. Doctrinal separation is the believer who is living in light and is in the sphere of darkness. And some of you have been in that situation. You were in a church that was in darkness, and you separated under response separation. And you did what the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. For, and then he goes on to list five things in Second Corinthians chapter 6, what fellowship hath light with darkness, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, God, with uh, Belial, and so forth. Uh, there is a response separation, but apostasy is believers who are living inside the cosmic system, the world system, the darkness system, and who react against the light. Uh, two, uh, that was point one, def a definition of uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, two, being involved in the cosmic system, the believer reacts to Bible doctrine, and uh, therefore he reacts to fellow believers who are positive who uh, to Bible doctrine. He reacts to believers who are living inside the divine dinosphere. And you'd be surprised the attitude that people in the darkness system have toward you if you're positive toward doctrine. Now, they don't talk you down to your face. And, uh, uh, but you are, a, you are a rebuke to them. Your positive volition is a rebuke to them, and therefore you don't realize how you become an object uh, of their uh, desire to get you to follow them out of the divine dinosphere. They have exited, and they, they, it galls them that you should stay in because you are a rebuke to them. And therefore, one of the best things that they can do is to get you to follow them, and they use everything that the devil uh, has devised in his cosmic system uh, to cause themselves to become a people test to you. And God doesn't uh, remove them from you. God says, good, uh, I'll allow these people to be a people test to you. Will you pass the people test or not? You know, And uh, these people uh, become that people test to you. Uh, three, um, uh, re reaction separation is not only the characteristic of apostasy uh, and reversionism, but it is also uh, an indication of the loss of real priorities in life. Four, the believer involved in reaction separation then is wrong, sinful, and producing human good and evil as well as sin. Five, biblical separation, response separation, is the function of the believer in light withdrawing from evil. He is doing the right thing, whereas reaction separation is doing the wrong thing. Six, reaction separation is a malfunction of gate number four of the divine dinosphere, which is knowledge and application of Bible doctrine. Remember, this is the momentum gate. And uh, 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 you have already, when, when this is true, obviously you're no longer filled with the Holy Spirit because you have sin. Mental attitude sins, grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. You immediately then lose what? Your objectivity and become subjective. When you become subjective is when you sit in Bible class and you be react to things that the pastor teacher teaches rather than respond to it. And of course then you lose your teachability, you become arrogant rather than humble, and the humble person accepts 
uh, what the, uh, the Lord has for him. And uh, if, if what is taught is not uh, applicable, he doesn't worry over it. He just uh, lets it go by. And, of course, having lost his motivation, the momentum is uh, the last thing to go, but it definitely goes. Seven. But with this loss of the priority of gate number four will come the, um, the, the malfunction of the grace apparatus for perception. And the grace apparatus for perception demands the daily inhale of Bible doctrine on the part of the believer, you see. And uh, as a result of this, uh, the malfunction of the grace apparatus for perception means that he's not growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This also results in the malfunction of the application of Bible doctrine, uh, malfunction of... Uh, uh, using the, uh, the, the problem-solving devices such as the faith rest drill. Uh, you see, uh, uh, he, he is unable to handle uh, people, the people test. And uh, uh, it is also a uh, failure uh, to switch to basic impersonal love uh, when uh, it is necessary in dealing with people. So uh, he can't pass the problem test. He can't pay, fa, pay, pass the people tests, and therefore he is failing the tests of life, but doesn't recognize that fact. Nine, reaction separation is really the only alternative which the believer has who is involved in the cosmic system, because he can't stand this constant teaching of the Word of God. He can't stand to have the Word of God taught. And uh, uh, whereas uh, in time past he loved to have exegesis, word by word, verse by verse, can now it becomes offensive to him. And uh, when it comes to uh, uh, categories of doctrine, he doesn't like it anymore. He used to love it. He used to uh, really enjoy it. But now it's repetition. It's something he's heard before, and it's old stuff, and he's looking for something new because he's the proverbial dilettante. And so by the action of his own free will, by his own choice, his own volition, uh, this uh, believer avoids association with uh, uh, the truth of the Word of God communicated to him by his right pastor. And so to avoid doctrinal teaching and its personal implication, the believer in the cosmic system separates himself. Please note a couple of passages that uh, go along with this. First of all, uh, the passage which I refer to, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3. Well, we'll begin in chapter 2 and then go to chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. As we look at verse 9, uh, we realize that there is a, the, the, uh, the interpretation of this has to do with the future period of time when the Antichrist itself, himself will be revealed. But there is application to every dispensation, and particularly to ours. Verse uh, 9, the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist is who is referred to, will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. Remember that. The, see, again, what, what appeals to the emotions? Miracles, signs, and wonders. That's for the people who, uh, instant spirituality and the, uh, the concept of miracles, signs, and wonders. Uh, so, uh, those people who are looking at experiences and saying, uh, thus and so, uh, shows that these people are from God because look at the miracles that are taking place. Or somebody writes, a miracle crusade. Come and see the miracles God is working. Let me tell you, stay away. The miracles, uh, God has not worked uh, what we would call phenomenal miracles since the canon of Scripture is completed. And he will not until the tribulation period uh, work miracles again. Uh, the, the withdrawing of the miracles uh, is his way of calling attention to the Word of God. We walk by faith, not by sight. All right, so uh, the working of this one will come in signs and wonders and miracles. Verse 10, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. Now, they perish because they refused 
to love the truth and the soul to be saved. See, first they refuse to love the truth. Verse seven, 11, for this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. There's a definite article in there, not to believe a lie, but the lie, referring to the lie of the enemy, the, uh, Satan's worker, the Antichrist. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Now this is... Uh, the future time, of course, uh, in, applica in, in interpretation. But application, it's true. People uh, receive the lie when they reject the truth. After all, what do you have left once you have rejected the truth? The grace of God may give you the truth many, many, many times. So you don't just get it once. And some of us, it took a little longer than others for the truth to dawn on us. Uh, and some of us have been in truth, gone to error, and uh, discipline has awakened us, and we've come back to the truth. Thank God for that. Now, Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, verse, we'll look at uh, beginning in verse 13, where he says, As for you, brothers, never tire of doing uh, what is right. Uh, this is the, uh, the noble and honorable thing. Now, verse 14. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter. Take special note of him in order... Uh, uh, do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Uh, uh, this is a, uh, an important principle. Uh, you see, uh, the instruction in, in this letter is doctrine. Paul was writing Bible doctrine. Here were people who were rejecting Bible doctrine. As a result, he says, if any reject Bible doctrine, then uh, take note of that person and do not associate with that person. Uh, uh, it's a beautiful uh, uh, principle. Don't treat him as an enemy. You know, don't treat him as an enemy, but, but admonish him. Uh, as a, a brother. Uh, this is the word nutheo. We've talked about it before. It's you just give information. Give Bible doctrine information without being involved emotionally in it and let them make their, their own decisions. Uh, turn back to Romans uh, for just a moment. We'll look at two verses. One in Romans chapter 12. I'm sure you recognize this uh, this verse, these verses, yeah, Romans 12, verses 2 and 3 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world system, the cosmos diabolicus, the world system, the world system of darkness. But, on the other hand, be transformed by the renewing of your mind through Bible doctrine. Then you will be able to test and approve uh, what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, his perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment. That's in uh, genuine humility, you see, uh, in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given to you. Now Romans chapter 16. You get someone who calls you aside and says, let's have lunch, and then they start uh, bad-mouthing doctrine or the, or the communicator of doctrine. Remember this verse. I urge you, verse 17, Romans 16, 17, and 18. Uh, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and who put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, mistranslation, their own emotions. Their own emotions is what the word is. Believe it or not, uh, they are they're concerned with their own emotions, you see. They, uh, uh, by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of the, well, it says they're naive, Really, it is, it is the guileless, akakas, uh, uh, meaning one who are uh, not evil, 
uh, those who do not have evil in them. And, and any believer who is uh, inside the divine dynasty could be considered to be uh, a guileless, uh, uh, who does not, uh, is a noble believer. A kakas is a nobility. A kakas is without nobility. And so you have c these people who are out there becoming people tests to uh, the believer. So it says, they separated from us. Uh, however, nevertheless, they were not really part of us. And then we have uh, the next uh, uh, clause, which begins... Uh, it's a, it's a, a second-class condition. It begins with a protasis of a second-class condition and uh, ends up with, uh, an, of course, an apotasis. And so it begins... Uh, uh, with the uh, the uh, conditional particle I, E-I, plus an imperfect active indicative, and that tells you that it is a second-class condition because E-I plus the indicative mood is a first-class condition. E-I plus any other mood is uh, 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 any other uh, part of the verb a form of the verb, is a second-class condition or a contrary-to-truth uh, uh, condition or what we would say uh, a negative uh, a clause. And it would be translated if and it's not true, all right? Okay. So we have here uh, uh, I plus the imperfect active indicative of the verb of absolute status quo, I me, an old friend of ours, uh, meaning to be. This is the imperfect tense of duration, referring to action which has taken place in the past up to the present time without inference as to whether the process will continue. The active voice, uh, the believer who is living in the cosmic system, produces the action of the verb, and the indicative mood is the reality of something which has actually taken place. Then we have the prepositional phrase ex, the ablative from ego, uh, and ek means from the immediate source, and ego is the preposition uh, for us. And so it says, for if they had been of us, but they were not, second class condition, you see. Now, the apotheosis of this says this, they would have remained with us. This is the particle of contingency on, which introduces the, the apotheosis of a second-class condition, plus the pluperfect of meno. Let's take a clean sheet here. Uh, meno, the a common word, we've seen it many times, means to remain, to abide, but this is called the pluperfect tense. This is, a uh, pluperfect is a past perfect. Uh, or we could say it is a present indicative from the past time. It represents an, an action as complete, and the results of the action have existed for a long period of time. So you recognize the fact that this is not something that just took place. It's something which has been working for a long, long time, and these people have been putting on this phony front. The active voice again, the believers in the cosmic system, the Antichrist produced this action and indicative for the uh, reality of the fact. Then we have the prepositional phrase meta, uh, which is uh, with or alongside, and then ego again. And so we have, uh, we have this, this statement, for if they had been part of us, and they were not. They would have remained with us, but they did not. That's the best way to translate the second class condition in the both the protasis and the apotasis of the second class condition. And so this translation says, says this in verse 19. These antichrists separated from us. Nevertheless, they were not really part of us. For if they had been part of us, and they were not, they would have remained with us, but they did not. So here is the potential that of every believer who is classified as an Antichrist. Antichrists are those believers who reside and function inside the cosmic system 
with the result that they are eventually entering the last stages of reversionism, reverse process reversionism, and apostasy. The second class condition indicates the potentiality of breaking out of the cosmic system if they wanted to, but the peace people have made a negative volitional decision and therefore there's no hope for them to get out of it as long as they remain on negative volition. Uh, uh, the second class condition also constitutes an explanation of reaction separation. Reaction separation either may begin with negative volition to doctrine, but it generally begins with mental attitude reaction in the area of people testing. They have failed the test in people testing. And they're going along in uh, uh, their positive toward Bible doctrine. And along comes temptation. Now, temptation comes to everyone. Remember that. And with temptation, you have the guardian of your soul, which is your free will and volition. The temptation in this case comes from the source of people. Now, there are different kinds of people who become testing to you. The first kind of a person who becomes a test to you is a good friend, someone you have had a great deal of rapport and fellowship with, someone who has been very close to you. And somehow or other, this person has gone negative, has entered into the cosmic system, and this person, as a friend, is now seeking to lead you astray and to cause you to follow him in his apostasy. And uh, they become, therefore, a people test to you. Uh, is doctrine more important or your friendship with this person? In our congregation in, in years gone by, friendship which has taken place, and I have to say this, uh, and I mean it objectively, uh, many times it has been friendship uh, between women that, uh, that has caused whole families to be destroyed. Women who have been negative toward the teaching of the Word of God worked on their husbands to the, to the place. And the husbands, of course, were obviously weak and, uh, in, their, in their doctrinal uh, allegiance, and therefore they eventually uh, went along with uh, their, their wives. But we have had the other way around. Very attractive people. People who uh, have known how to ingratiate themselves into the hearts of other people. People who will do things uh, for other people and uh, have therefore become very, very attractive. People who have scintillating personalities and uh, who uh, uh, will lead others astray. This is exactly what Absalom did at the door of the city when uh, his father failed to completely forgive him, uh, and yet he brought him back in, Absalom had seething resentment against his father David, and therefore he uh, went down to the gate of the city. And when people came in to the gate of the city, which is what would be the courtroom, when the people came to the court with uh, problems to be adjudicated, he would discern if they were from the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom. Uh, the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin, he would let those people pass through and let them go to David uh, or David's uh, uh, people to uh, be adjudicated. But if they were from the northern ten tri uh, tribes, he would then say, well, I'd, I'll take care of, uh, of this problem. I'll be glad to, to uh, uh, be the judge, and I'm the king's son. Who could be better uh, uh, to think how the king's? And so he won the hearts of the northern kingdom of the ten tribes. He, in fact, it says, he stole their hearts. He stole their allegiance by sitting at the gate of the temple. And then when he realized he had enough strength, then he raised up uh, a, uh, a rebellion. And actually, he had so many people on his side that he forced David to exit the city. And one of the saddest sights in all of Scripture is when David and a few of his uh, loyal followers are leaving the palace and going across the brook Kidron outside of Jerusalem and tears streaming down David's face because his own son has led the rebellion. His own son is against him. His own son wants his life. And he goes in, into hiding because of what the Absalom had done. Absalom stole the hearts of the people and David becomes rejected by the people who one time said, we want David to rule over us. There's nobody like David. Good old David. He's tremendous. Now they're saying he's a dirty, low-down, no good, good-for-nothing dog. And he goes out weeping. 
And one of his very, very dearest of friends, he, ta he calls Ahithophel his bosom friend. He says, someone, we used to go to the Word, of, we used to go to the temple together, which meant that they loved doctrine. They used to, to study doctrine together under the teaching of the ministry of the prophets and the priests. They went to the, to the place together. He says, he has become a false friend. He has lifted up his heel against me, a Hebrew idiom which says that he has become an enemy. And Ahithophel becomes one of the counselors of uh, Absalom. When it comes time now for Absalom to decide what to do, uh, now what should he do? Should he uh, pursue David and kill him? Or should he uh, uh, regroup? And he calls these, uh, these people together. And Ahithophel says, if you want to take over this kingdom, you go after your father and slit his throat. Kill him. Get rid of him. And he was right. David was vulnerable. He was vulnerable at that time. However, there was someone who was loyal to David, who, who was going to go with him. And David said, no, you stay. You stay and give false advice to Absalom. And so he, he, uh, he turns to his other advisors, and this, uh, this loyal advisor says, Oh, David is like a caged lion now. You attack him now, and he'll destroy you. Which was not, good, right, the, well, not the right advice, because that wasn't true. David was a whipped puppy. But uh, Absalom starts thinking, he said, I know my, my, I know my old man. I, he's probably, you're right. You're right. So he determined not to attack, not to follow after David. And there gave David a time to regroup and recoup and uh, for uh, uh, the, 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 the turnaround to take place. But uh, those sad words have been always uh, tragic. When you hear, uh, you read that uh, Ahithophel mine own bosom friend has lifted up his hand as heel against me. Okay. But, beloved, uh, never put people on a pedestal. Never put people on a pedestal. That is iconoclastic arrogance because they're going to have feet of clay. They're going to they're fail you at one time or another. The only celebrity of the Christian way of life is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And be careful of the friend who will lead you astray. But there is also a kind of a person uh, who is a friend, but who turns against you, like Ahithophel, you know. And if this friend turns against you, and you react with mental attitude sins, you see, that person has also caused you to fall, to go astray. Then you, of course, have your enemies. Yeah, with friends like you, who, who needs enemies, as somebody has once said. Uh, but you have those enemies who uh, are, are against you and, and have, have uh, done uh, bad things against you. And again, you react with mental attitude sins. Okay, so you have all kinds of people tests. Like uh, uh, someone has said, uh, you know so-and-so, he's going around telling all kinds of lies about you. The other guy said, well, it's just so long as he doesn't tell the truth, I'm safe, you know. Uh, but but um, the people who gossip, the people who are waiting and watching for your downfall, okay, well, their people tests are out there. Well, the point uh, here is very, very clear, that uh, here are people, possibly they were at one time positive, but now they are a people test to you. Now, what are you going to do? You have, from the source of your volition, to face the same thing that they faced. They went negative uh, at the point of, of whatever the temptation was, allowed the temptation to enter their soul. They exited the divine dinosphere, entered the cosmic system, and then they have become the people test uh, to you. And you now face the same situation. And so uh, that's the point of uh, this, uh, the testing that comes to you from uh, the source of others who have uh, become reactor, reactor separators. Uh, whatever gates are involved, it all begins with mental attitude sins and spreads throughout the entire uh, cosmic system. And uh, uh, what happens eventually is that arrogance interlocks with hatred, just as it did with uh, Ahithophel. At one time, Ahithophel loved David. Now, we don't know for sure what happened in Ahithophel's life, but it's uh, the, the, the uh, uh, empirical be 
that since Ahithophel was an uncle to Bathsheba, and that uh, David did what he did to Bathsheba's husband Uriah, and to put all of this phoniness, that after this took place, that Ahithophel became disillusioned with David. Before that time, David was his fair-haired friend and could do no wrong. Now he saw that David had feet of clay. He, David was a sinner like everybody else, and he couldn't take that. And so he began with mental attitude sin and began to e eventually get into the hatred complex in which he got into conspiracy arrogance and criminal arrogance in which he actually planned to he plotted the death of David by the advice he gave to uh, Absalom. Uh, there is further interlock as the inter apostasy continues because, you see, once you're involved in arrogance uh, and hatred, you're going to with pseudo-truth. You're going to have to give your, uh, your you, you definitely throw uh, 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 your religious experience out the window. Most people have at least some kind of a, an aesthetic background, so they involve themselves in seeking some pseudo-truth. And remember, it's as much like the truth as possible. But it is not the truth, which is why most people who have left us have gone to one or two churches, and I can name them to you, but I won't do it, because they are close, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a counterfeit $20 bill may be close, but it's not, the same. It's not a $20 bill. And uh, uh, so this will very uh, often happen. But pseudo-truth, and then uh, this, of course, uh, interlocks with human good and evil. That's why some of the people who were formerly with us are now involved in moral degeneration, and they're marching against abortion clinics, and they're going to Washington, D.C., and mar being a part of this big movement. That's their business. That's fine. They can do that all they want. But it's, a, it's just, I didn't invent these things. This is the, what the Word of God teaches. And yet you follow the lives of some of these folks, and you say to yourself, my goodness, it just follows along like day follows, and it follows, it just clears the bell. All right, so are they one of us that they might be manifest that they were not all of us? Uh, us we have but, and that uh, our time to go fast, and we'll pick it up. And thank Father for this word, the word of God, and its application. Help us to. Be